I have one song. One of my songs has been streamed close to three million streams. To me, personally, it's fantastic. I love seeing that. But that, from a financial standpoint, affected my life 0.0%. I made virtually no money off of that. So there, the industry has changed so much because you look at these per, kind of performance metrics, but how do they translate into actual revenue? You were the one you got underneath my skin and then you broke into hey, good morning. This is the Mark Halley Show and uh, welcome back. Today, I, I think we have a great guest and I hope you'll agree with me. Uh, he's a fellow by the name of Aaron Sprinkle. Uh, singer, songwriter, producer, and been at the game for a long, played with a lot of different people, and I- I'm just psyched to uh, hear about his story uh, more and more. So uh, without much further ado, I will say hello, Aaron, and want you to tell us who you are, what you are now, and then we'll whittle our way back through life. Hey, Mark. Thanks for having me. Um, yeah, like you said, my name is Aaron Sprinkle, and I have been in the music business for going on oh geez it is about 30 years now so Mm -hmm. um and in a lot of different capacities as an artist uh, recording artist touring artist um record producer recording engineer composer mixer um songwriter all that kind of stuff and i still kind of bounce around all that Mm -hmm. um yeah. So what's fascinated me with a lot of people who are artists, and um, I have a I have a couple friends of mine who play in bands here, and mm-hmm. you know, they're making not, not making any money, but they clearly love it. Yeah. Uh, it's just it almost when I talk to them, they just act like, well, I I don't. It's what makes me live. Yeah. It just keeps. It's the thing that makes me thrive. Yep. Um, to the point where they're getting in dingy little bars and playing at night and barely making a buck and. About, if anything, mm-hmm. uh, maybe gas money at best, mm-hmm. uh, but they keep doing it. So when, when, you know, when, like when in your life did you kind of get this spark of interest in music and then kind of, I don't know, stumble along and made it something that you saw as a career? Well, it was really young, that spark. I, I do have sort of this, uh, you know, origin story moment that I can look back at. Um, I grew up on Vashon Island out here in the Pacific Northwest, and my parents were into music and even musical. My Both of them played music. But um, when I was in about third grade, I heard a song um, on a Walkman. It was actually, it was the first Walkman I'd ever seen. So I was very mostly interested in that. But when I put them, put the headphones on and press play, um, the song that came on suddenly became way more important than the technology I was interested in. Sure, sure. And I, I'd never heard anything like it. I never heard music kind of in this way. And it was um, Lovely Rita by the Beatles off of Sgt. Oh, Peppers. Oh, yeah, yeah. And I just remembered just this sort of soundscape and the, this way it made me feel and i didn't even i don't didn't even know what the lyrics were or what it meant but there was something about that moment that i ran home to my parents and told them about it and that feeling that i got in that moment is something that i have identified later in life as something that i still chase i'm still chasing um that same feeling um in the music that I'm a part of or that I'm creating, I'm trying to get that same Back sort of emotional that. response that I got. Have you in been that able moment. to get it? Um, definitely not fully. And, you know, I, I think that's part of the hunt, you know, is you're chasing that. You kind of know you're never going to really hit it. Um, but I've had glimpses. I've had moments where I um, have hit some mark and... And then that evolves over time too. Mm-hmm. And you know, your path veers here and strays there and you end up getting back to that. Okay, why am I doing this? You know, cause the why for me is uh, really important. Uh, sure, almost sure. M- more than the what or the how or all that is the why. And um, so yeah, that, and then I, I did start to play music. There were instruments around, um, 
I started playing guitar fairly young, you know, third, fourth grade, something wow. like that. Um, and piano. I've never had any formal music training, so it was all by ear. Um, just kind of picking out things that I would hear and trying to emulate them. And um, by the time I was in sixth, seventh grade, I was writing songs and recording songs on very primitive um, equipment that I had just borrowed from people or you know, scrounged up and sort of Frankenstein together this sort of home recording studio. Sure. Um, but yeah, it was just something uh, that I, I like to say I couldn't not do it. Sure. Um, I had to do it. That's That was always the driving thing for me. It didn't, it wasn't a choice. Um, yeah. It was yeah. something that was just, I was obsessed with. It was in me that I couldn't stop doing. I have heard for me, you know, as being a small business owner, mm -hmm. Uh, you know why? Why right. do you why did you, why did you do that? And I read somewhere that um, because you internally you felt that you had no choice. Mm -hmm. It wasn't you know, you know, it wasn't for money. They say because there's a lot of people don't make money. It wasn't for no boss. Oh, you will have a boss, mm -hmm. a cop, not a cop. What I mean, yeah, hopefully not a cop. <laughs> you know, a bank employee, whatever right. it may be. Independence mm -hmm. probably not going to have independence from it. So a lot of the things that you think are <clears throat> classically the great business owner none of those are worthy considerations right it's just i have to right done yeah uh, and you said one other thing about chasing that one high mm -hmm. by the way the song my favorite song when i was younger is there's one called um i think it was when the rain comes you run and hide your head it was by the it was by the beatles mm -hmm. and i remember being like in seventh grade and would play out back and it, back east, it would rain in the yeah. spring. And I just thought, wow, it's so cool. Yeah. You know, they're, they're, they're writing for me. Yeah, uh, which, I love that you know, song. Yeah, yeah, it's a great song. But anyway, they say also, as, as somebody who's in recovery and has been his whole life, yeah. that one of the things that people will chase is they'll say, I want to get back to that first high. Yep. I want to get back to that first high. First high is never coming again. Nope. You know? Yeah. Uh, it's and, very similar. And actually, I was... I have been in and out of recovery uh, for a, a number of years as well. And that was sort of when I was able to identify that analogy of that yeah. first high because yeah. I was a, I heard that verbiage in, in the rooms. And okay. um, so I was able to kind of, oh, that's really similar to yeah. This, yeah. The, you know, the parallel with the music. Yeah. And, yeah. yeah. Well, I didn't, I didn't mean to try and per se out you <laughs> no i don't care i'll talk about <laughs> i anything. don't either I don't you know, know. <laughs> i'm in recovery i go yeah. to aa meetings yeah. i'm yeah. you know therapist you name yeah. it i need yeah. help from every yeah. freaking angle i can bring get my on. hands on yeah <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I am you know, chicken hearted when this when it comes yeah. to this world <laughs> not af afraid to say it yeah. so over the course of some 30 years uh, you know i know in any life or any business or anything you're doing there's just these hardcore changes yeah. So, I mean, if you just kind of tiptoe, not tiptoe, maybe that's not, we don't need 30 iterations. Right. But if you were to hack it into a handful of pieces, what, what would that be in, in your, maybe personally and objectively, uh, the music industry? Well, for me personally, you know, when I first had these dreams of making music, it was to be, you know, the rock star, be in the band, you know, to be on the stage and, singing the songs and in the music videos and um in my late teens I quickly discovered that that really wasn't where I wanted to be it was more uh in the studio um helping other artists realize their vision and um championing and sort of coming alongside and um expressing this stuff and I loved the the sort of control you had over mm -hmm. what was happening in the Could studio. Could you like yell at them and tell them to go to hell, <laughs> kick them out? <laughs> yeah. Get, well, get the hell out of that here. That wasn't the kind of control I was referring to, but that also is pretty awesome. But I just mean like versus a, per, a live performance where it's sort of this, you know, what you see is what you get. And in the studio, you could kind of shape and mold and try things. And, and I love both aspects of music, but I quickly discovered that my home was in the studio hmm. um, I felt more at ease than I did on stage and it was working people kept coming back to me wanting to do more and eventually you know 
um, the records were selling, the bands were getting signed, and then the labels were wanting me to work on these records. And, um, and then, you know, that, so that evolution from sort of throwing myself into the fire, you know, not really knew, knowing that I could figure it out as I went, um, which is absolutely what I did at the beginning. I mean, I still do it to some extent now, but, you know, when I was 18 or 19 is when I started producing albums for uh, labels, you know, professionally. And, you know, I would straight up, like lie to these labels they would be like have you ever done a record like this or done it in this studio (laughs) or whatever or have you ever done a you know and i'd be like absolutely and do you know how to do that absolutely and i wasn't who doesn't exactly (laughs) and i would just figure it out on the fly you know Mm -hmm. because that's how i I had done everything up to that point it was working okay so um but then you kind of transition from that to being the guy in the room with the most experience you know to, to you fast forward 20 years and you're the guy who has done all that you've made hundreds of records and um so that that's a big change and then you, you got to kind of take stock of your you got to be like okay well I'm now I'm that guy so why am I here like you got to make sure you're you're still on the right path um, but as far as the music business has changed, I mean, let, let me circle back on that. Yeah, for one moment, you know, when whenever you're doing anything, and myself included, I was a sales and marketing guy. Mm-hmm. You know, if you said something like, you know, I can do it, I, I had, and maybe you hadn't, I had great confidence that I could, and that mm-hmm. I had the support around me, and I had everybody. You know, I didn't, I wouldn't just flagrantly, you know, say, could you make an orange product, and I. I knew I couldn't. I would just say, oh, yeah, I can do orange. Yeah. No, you can't. (laughs) Yeah. That's just a lie. You're never going to make orange. Um, But, you know, they say, what's your value proposition? And, you know, that's kind of the business comment. Mm -hmm. Um, So you're, 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 you're at some point in your life, uh, and I imagine it was a little after you kind of fought your way through it. um, When would you say uh, versus the stage, you came to some belief that you wanted to be inside, and then eventually that became your true value when when do you like let's say getting away from the stage how quickly did you realize you didn't like that oh pretty quickly i mean like 19 years old i mean i I still did it i still was in bands and i would play shows and but my touring was super limited because i just was like no i can't i'm in the studio making this record with this band so it really changed the um potential you know it limited the potential for my career as an artist um, because, you know, it, it was all about your record was all about getting done so you could go out and tour and support that record, right? And the touring became something that I just wasn't able to do anymore um, because I um, was in the studio. And also, you know, I was in these bands, um, one band in particular that got signed when I about about that same time when I was eighteen, you know, I did that for a while, and you know, um, if anything, for sure, lost money. If you were, if you zoomed out and looked at the whole thing, there was, a, a, you know, a, a loss. And making records was, I was actually making a little bit of money doing that. Mm-hmm. So that's I was like, an easy choice. Yeah, I was like, okay, mm-hmm. go. Go red, yeah, or go, go black, green. yeah, mm. go black, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So yes, so um, it was pretty quick, and and it's still it's something that I still, you know, wrestle with a little bit. Anyway, uh, local band, really good, yeah, uh, Grant Mullen, but he had just come back from a pretty extensive tour, yeah. Um, and I was thinking, man, that's really time consuming. Oh yeah, I mean, especially if you have a family, yeah. it's just like holy shit. He's gone for like nine months, mm-hmm. and you know, I traveled a lot as a salesman through my life, you know, internationally. Right. You know, that's a grind. Yeah. You know, hotel room, hotel room, hotel room. You don't get good sleep. You don't get yeah. good eating. Uh, I guess you just get off on getting on the stage, and that's it. Drives you. Yeah, and I love that. That is what is other people's calling. You know. I, I, those are all some of my best friends, you know, that I've yeah. made over the yeah. years are these guys that have been touring their whole lives. And, but it's just, it's, it's not how I'm wired. It's not for me. That's just yeah. not what I'm, you know, cut out for. Yeah. So when, when you settled into your in studio and production and the like, uh, when would you say that your, you know, your, your value kind of hit, hit the spot? 
Well, yeah, there's a, a couple different sort of levels I hit. And there's definitely this sort of teeth cutting, you know, uh, segment in there where once I was actually in the rooms making records, you know, really early on, I had a hand in sort of bringing this band from Bremerton to a label called MXPX and they ended up kind of blowing up and I produced their first record when I was 18 or 19 and Do that you mind mentioning their name mxpx is the oh, name oh of the i band. thought that yeah. was the record no um okay. they are yeah they're i mean i thought that was the, la- still, the label no yeah so i i had a friend that had a label called tooth and nail records that he was just starting i ended up kind of connecting with the mxpx guys at a show um i think it, the show was in bremerton it was when i first saw them play and i offered to record them for free um as long as I could give it to my friend Brandon, who was starting this label. And he ended up signing them, and I ended up producing their first album. And that definitely put me on the map. It was a big part of what put me on the map. It wasn't like, oh, now I don't have to worry ever again, and you know I'm rich or whatever. Um, it was the beginning of a long period of grinding, you know, for a really long time. You know, I worked... Pretty much from that point until, you know, that was like 93 to 2012. Um, Are you, you out know. of the game now? No, um, I saw some no, were, no, I'm not. It, what I do has shifted a lot since around 2012, or maybe actually a little later than that. Uh, that's just when I moved to Tennessee. But um, Oh, okay, that's right, you mentioned that. But... You know, working, you know, there was a, a decade there where I was working probably 14, 16 hours a day. Just for, cranking. Um, Just cranking. On average, probably 28 days a month like that, you yeah, know. Yeah. How old were you then? Um, I was in my 30s. Yeah. 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 Late well, 20s, I, I, I've 30s. I've frequently told, you know, one of the, some of the audience we speak to here is, you know, this younger professional, maybe, maybe 25 to 45, no, mm-hmm. 25 to 35, I'd say, maybe a little older. That you know, we we pass through a window in life, and you you can choose it any way you want, but you have energy, mm-hmm. and ungodly amounts of energy. Mm-hmm. You know, I would call it maybe maybe a maybe a twenty five to thirty year run where the engines are on. Yeah, and at sixty three, I realized, holy moly, uh, I was just cranking, and other people who choose not to do that. Um, well, that is a decision in itself, mm-hmm. and if you if you if you think you can wait until you're forty to turn that on, that's cool. Just remember, there's people who've been running really hard since they were twenty eight, right. and you're not going to catch up anymore. Yeah. So back to um, you know back to this this production and finding your value, uh, you know your value proposition. I mean, you're a young guy. You don't have a value proposition much at 19, you know? No, and it was it was really... I, I would say really it came with this sort of... Um, I, I had been really focusing on a lot of independent artists in Seattle. I wasn't doing a ton of label work. I actually ended up getting a job doing um, pre-press and graphic design at a software publisher out here in, in, Bel- in Bellevue at the time. Um, <laughs> And um, took about a year off from really doing music. And then this opportunity came up that I saw as an opportunity where this, that same label that I'd brought um, that MXPX band to, um, they were based in Seattle. The owner, who was a friend of mine, Brandon, he, I heard through the grapevine that he was putting a studio in the office of the label, which... You know, not a lot of labels have their own studio, at least at the time they didn't, especially at the level he was at. And I remember I just sort of basically called him and was like, I, I want to do, I want to be the guy running the studio. And he was like, I, he's like, I'm, you're really not the guy I'm looking for. You know, I had a, I had a kid and was married and at the time and, um, he was like, I'm looking for someone a little younger with a little less responsibility. I just don't know if I can, if I really want to take on the responsibility of, you know, paying your bills through this studio. And I was like, well, I, I'm, I'm going to do it. 
so I just literally showed up and said, I, I work here now, even though he told me he didn't want me to. Tough and, luck. Yeah. <laughs> and that was really the beginning of this kind of crazy run that I had with that label. I, I never worked officially for the label or had any kind of exclusivity with them, but I did end up doing probably 80% of the records over the next 12 years for um, his label. It's and, tooth and Nail? Mm-hmm, tooth and Nail, nail Records. Yeah. They're still here based in, in the Seattle area. And during that period, I ended up sort of, that's really when things kind of took off for me as a producer, um, just because these artists I was working with were coming in. They Everyone was loving the records. They were selling like hotcakes. And, you know... When, when an album sells... Do you get a piece of it, or do you just charge the hours out? Or no, no I a- there. Yeah, no, I get. Um, there's basically two revenue streams from the the traditional sale, you know. And th- this is one of the things that's changed a lot because this is about 2001 th- th- when I started back working with them. Um, there's there's the revenue stream of whoever wrote the song. Yep. Okay. I knew that. And then there is a revenue stream. Um, based on whoever, basically the ownership of the recording. And the bands, the the artist or the band will get a, a percentage of the profit from the ownership of the recording. And the producer also gets a, a, a small percentage of that. And then if I ended up writing on records, which pretty much became almost standard, um, where I would, you know, help the bands with their songs to get them better or help them write songs, even in when some cases. When you're a producer, I, I always like, I'm like, okay, he sings shit and then he writes stuff. And that always trips me out that you can write these lyrics. Lyrics, I just think some of them are so beautiful and I think they could not possibly come out of my mind. <laughs> um, but now production, uh, okay, so I'm I'm guy with my buddies and I think I have some great songs and and you know, maybe I need some help with lyrics or I don't have great words, songs, and, and they come in to you, uh, and then what the hell are you doing, you know? That's a really good question, and it's 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 a question I get a lot. Like, what does that even mean to be a record producer? And so the, the short answer is I'm responsible for the end product mm-hmm. of the recording, like – on me. So kind of like a director of a film. The long answer is, or longer answer is, how I go about doing that varies wildly in the industry. You know, some people literally just sort of oversee the record and they, they're they like, yes and no. Like, that's bad, that's good. Do it again, keep that. So you're in the studio and you're just saying, like it, Pull that, like it, keep that. Right. Like it. So you're not in there tweaking. No, some people are like that. And that's a- almost more of a traditional thing where you kind of separate the producer from the recording engineer and then the songwriters from the performers and the session musicians from the artists. There's this kind of old school way of doing things. Um, but I was more, I'm I'm a more hands-on person. So I'm in there. I'm, I'm actually doing the recording i'm running the sessions i am recording each take and saying yep we got it and let's move on i'm saying okay this song now we got the drums and bass done now we need to add this guitar this other guitar what about a piano what about this building these songs to get them to ultimately sound like i'm hearing them in my head maybe adding elements on to create more more um impact or whatever you want to call right. it. Right. Yeah. What just they sort want. of this, uh, it's, it's just me chasing this. I can hear it finished in my head. So I'm, I'm trying to figure out how to get from point A to point B or the band has expressed, you know, they really or the, like or, this or you, sound or And whatever. I guess if you're pursuing something, it's like doing painting, they might say, eh, you know, I don't like that. I don't like the blue in there. You know, and you, you were chasing something and you have to sort of share it with them. But I guess at some point you have to do some recording and they may, they have the, I presume the artist has the, uh, uh, latitude to say, gee, I don't know. Oh, absolutely. Like that. Yeah, so it's about communication. But one thing I realized kind of later on in my life, like maybe in my late 20s, early 30s, is everything that I um, have learned to do, like from playing the guitar, playing the piano, writing a song, singing, um, recording a drum kit, mixing a song, 
all of those skills that I've learned all were just the means to the end, which was just to have the finished recording of the song. So I wasn't ever like, I really want to be the world's greatest guitar player. I really want to be the world's greatest engineer. I want to be the world's greatest songwriter. I just wanted to make the world's greatest recorded songs. Hmm. That that was, so I just would when figure out. When did that come upon you? Because, I mean, I know you said 19 or 20, but you talked about being, you know, fifth grade, sixth grade. Oh, mm-hmm. you heard this Beatles song and da 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 But to kind of go, now I want to create this thing. That's a pretty developed thought. Yeah, and that is interesting. And I, I didn't, I took it for granted when I was young. Like, like of course, you know, I wanted to produce music. But when I think about it now, especially after having kids and, you know, all that stuff, it's like, where did that come from? Because I can distinctly remember in third or fourth grade after hearing that Beatles song, I wanted to know how they made the recording. Ah, I ah, wanted to understand okay. how they made these elements that felt like they were doing that and hitting my brain and my soul and my heart and like how did they make it sound like that so um, interesting because i never with music i'm just chasing that endorphin or whatever you want to call it that emotional right. high. i don't i don't i don't give a shit how they made it most people don't and that's one of the beautiful things about music is it's really binary it's like this connects with me emotionally or it doesn't you know yeah. i like it i don't like it you know, most people don't even really think about the emotional side of it, which is, I think, 100% of why people listen to music is because of how it affects them emotionally. Um, but I wanted to get, I wanted to see how, what was behind the curtain. How were they making it? Because I wanted to make it. From a very I wanted, young age. From a very young age, very yeah. Very cool, very cool. Um, that's an interesting thing. So now you're producing, and are there any are there any people that come in and maybe listen to some of your songs and say, "Ooh, I'd l- I would like to play that," or do you do you do, do they come to you and say, "Here's what I want to write about," or how does that you know is it ch- which is chicken before the egg or either one of them? So my because of the path I went on um, as really com- kind of record producer was my f- forward sort of thing, right? Um, band it started with bands mostly bands, some solo artists, but coming to me and saying, can you, I want these songs that I've written to sound professional, to have this kind of vibe to them. Can you make that record? Can you, is that something you, do you like my music? Do you like what we're doing? And um, along the way of doing that, I started writing with them, helping them. Sometimes it would just be as simple as like, the bridge or the pre-chorus or chorus needed a different chord in there. Or like, what if you repeated that line here again? Cause it's really catchy. Like, let's do it again here. And then that evolved into me sitting down from scratch, writing songs with some of these artists. Um, and I mean, I've always been a songwriter cause I, the, when I, the first songs I ever wrote were for me to sing or yeah. my band that I was yeah. in. And, but it sort of just evolved. I it, I haven't done a ton of kind of when you think of like someone going to Nashville to be a songwriter. They're sitting with their guitar and they write a whole song and then they're pitching it out to all these famous people to try to get them to record it. That's just not been the path I'm on. I have friends that do that. It, I think it's amazing that, that people can do that. But my my songwriting has always been in the context of a project, a record, um, some sort of thing that's happening. Um, as um, so, I hope that answers your question. But um, all of the things, and then you know, I'll end up playing on someone's record. You know, there'll be a guitar part I have an idea well, for I mean, on let, their song, we'll and I'll circle play. Circle back, yeah. You were, you were. I mean, I think we're touching on the subject whether mm. um, every word is perfect for the final. Um, you're basically saying you enjoyed from a young age, trying to figure out how to do the whole piece put together. And then depending on who comes to you, you may put a couple elements together. Mm -hmm. You may put the significant portion of them. You may put, you know, so what I'm hearing is there's a little bit of a, uh, kind of like a smorgasbord of services that there really are. But the ultimate is that thing. Like I said, I like, can I assist and come alongside and make the vision realized? Can we, can we get a final product? 
because that's ultimately my responsibility as a producer. And how we get there is different depending on the different situations, the different artists, the different, you know, projects that I'm you know, working You mentioned, um, I, I never know what this stuff is in music, you know. I think I know as I've gotten older, but I was listening to one of your songs, uh, Instrumentals, mm -hmm. uh, and I think it was number three. And I was listening to it last night, and I was enjoying it, and then I was thinking... Is he playing all those goddamn instruments in the background? Or does he have like a band sitting in there with him that he's got, the, you know, he's got the little thing he's like this doing, you know? And then you always hear about, no, I lay one track over yeah. another. Yeah. So I was, uh, what, how did you go about, you, I presume you know the, the the music I'm talking about, this instrumental. Yes. H how did you go about, like, is that, go ahead, you, you say it, not me. Okay, so those, those instrumental records um, that are on Spotify or Apple Music or the different streaming services are a result of kind of of a career change I took about six years. It'll actually be six years at the end of this year that I've been doing this. So, And it's not that wild of a shift, and I still am doing all the stuff that I told you about, but I'm doing it less often in, in a more kind of focused way. But um, about six years ago, I took a job, an actual w 2 full-time job which you are grown up you yeah are getting i know crazy. i feel like a big boy <laughs> uh for at a at a, a, a music licensing company and oh. so this company does a number of things but primarily especially when they when we started um or when i started they have a catalog of music that is available to creators of all sorts filmmakers youtube uh creators podcasters television, film, TV, movie, all that, they have a catalog of songs that are available to license that are royalty-free. And they asked me to be a composer for hmm. their catalog, which sounds really fancy, but all it means is I, they they kind of tell me, like, we need a bunch of songs that sound like this. And I make those songs. Like, they don't care how I make them, Instrumentally right? or uh, both songwriting? I've done a few songs for them that have vocals, but they mostly are looking for instrumental songs from mm -hmm. me at this job. And so though all the um, instrumental release, and they end up releasing everything that I do, do for them. And I, and I compose under about a dozen monikers for them because, um, and Aaron Sprinkle is one of those monikers, but I have uh, something like 11 or 12 more monikers and um, based on different genres of music as I do uh, EDM and hip hop and rock and all these different genres of music that I do. Um, but that has been uh, a really awesome, I love it because I'm now I'm just at home. I work at home. Um, I'm making these songs and I'm getting to experience sort of this different side where I'm not working with as many other artists. I'm mostly doing this completely. And to answer your question, yes, I did play everything on those songs. Um, but those songs were intentionally crafted for use in TV, film, video, okay, okay. that kind Back, of stuff. Background or opening, closing, right. things of that. But right. Yeah, I enjoyed them. They were, uh, I just, I listened to, you know, maybe a couple of them, but that number three is the one that, you know, I jotted cool. some notes on, you know, like, oh, I kind of like that one. You know, and um, that, that one just sort of turned me on. Um, now, as, again, I mentioned to you before the changes, and you sort of said, oh, in your youth, you know, were more changes within you. But now what, what about the industry? I mean, you're writing from your heart, mm -hmm. but I presume also there's an audience out there, and you have to somehow right. so tweak the, into their game. The industry has changed so much since I started, and... Um, also, my sort of awareness of and understanding of the industry has has grown so much and sort of, um, you know, peaks and valleys of that, too, of being hopeful and excited and then really jaded and negative about the industry as well. But the industry, you know, going from when I started, it was traditional sales. Like there was basically th three revenue streams, right? There was like someone buying your cassette or CD or vinyl. There was getting your song on the radio or um, MTV or something. And then there was like getting the song used in a television commercial or a film or a television show. That's basically it, you know, as far as revenue. Um, 
And those those metrics <clears throat> are very like kind of easy to wrap your head around and had very established um, royalty rates and protocol for like when someone buys a CD or a cassette or a vinyl, you get this much money. And it's very just chop, 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 easy, cut and dry. Um, and the whole language and sort of um, metrics around success within the industry was very easy to understand and interpret. Like this record sold this many copies. It's gold. It sold 500,000 copies. That means 500,000 people went into some sort of store and purchased it, you know. And then over time, has since physical music is just a novelty now, vinyl is really the only thing that's alive in the physical music world. And it makes up a you know, pretty low amount of, yeah, yeah. of how we it's kind consume of an, um, music. Kind of like a niche thing. It's very, yeah, very yeah. much so. And it's, I love vinyl. It's amazing. The artists can actually make a decent amount of money on it because, you know, the resale value is great on a vinyl, but, um, or the retail value is what I mean. The markup is really good on it. But um, now it's all streaming and the the way that the rev- revenue gets dished out for the streaming and how they're, it's all just a big mess right now. There isn't any you hear you know one thing from one person and one thing from another person and it's just evolving and changing in a ton of gray area and um you know there's the villains here and the demons over here and you know because you know you you see a song get streamed a million times on like i have one song one of my songs has been streamed Close to three million streams on. Which one was that? Because I went through a handful of your most popular. It's called album. Whisper Something. It's on 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 Spotify. It's got almost three three million. Oh, and, no, that's a good tick. Well, and that I hit a couple that I think one to two million. Yeah, but I didn't see the three million. Huh. So that that to me personally is fantastic. I love seeing that. It's like wow, that's crazy. I cannot believe that. But that, from a financial standpoint, affected my life 0.0%. I made right. virtually no money off of that. So there, the industry has changed so much because you look at these per, kind of performance metrics, but how do they translate into actual kind of revenue? You think you sell 3 point some million, you know, 3.1 million people listen to your music and you put time and energy into it and then you don't get shit for it. Yeah, like... Uh, I don't know how much I've made from that per- particular song, but it's probably in the range of hundreds of dollars at the most. So you're not buying new cars or new houses no, with that? No. <laughs> so that, more than, and I'm not here to whine about it. I understand that the technology, the way people consume, everything has evolved and changed um, over time. And it's just going to. There's no, but I feel like we're in sort of this big transitionary phase where we're trying to figure out how do we make it work? Um, Cause you got these people, you know, obviously making, someone's making a Truck shit ton works. of money off yeah, of that. Yeah. Um, you know, it's just not the artists right now. And, uh, and then just also there are just the, the amount of people creating and releasing music is so exponentially higher than it was when I started. You just, you, you can't even wrap your head around it. I mean, everyone, and that, is a lot a lot of it's due to obviously the internet but it's also due to the accessibility of the technology to make music right you can buy a laptop for a thousand dollars and it comes with stuff that you couldn't even get when i started making music right Mm -hmm. like you couldn't even dream of it it's just on there already and that is incredible to me i think it's beautiful i think everyone that should that wants to make music should make music I, I just think the more the merrier. I always have been a proponent of technology. I've always considered myself sort of on the edge of, you know, pushing the, the technological mm-hmm. limits, which, you know, really the Beatles were doing that too. George Martin was doing that too back in the day, even though they were only using what we would consider to be primitive technology now. They were pushing the boundaries. And I love that there's more people making music, but it does make it murkier. You know, it's harder to distinguish between what is successful and what isn't. So you better do it because you just like doing it and then hopefully hit it. I mean, <laughs> I hate to draw an analogy, but it's a little like podcasts, you know, 
um, when I started doing this, um, I did it because I liked it. Right. I just wanted to do it. You know, I had sold yes. my business and I felt I was always good at conversing with people. I always loved it. I love meeting people. I love staring them eye to eye. Yeah. Seeing if I can create some connection. Right. Uh, that's just been what I've loved. So right. And the, how much freedom is there in something when you're released of that burden of having to, to for, for having these expectations of certain levels of success or revenue or all this stuff, you, then you can really just do it. Right. Yeah. And music for me in my life has always kind of bounced back and forth between those two things. Cause you know, um, some people, would look at me and look at like how many records I've produced and how many, how much of an impact those records have had on music scenes or uh, people's lives or how many they've sold or all these things and be like, he is a very successful, you know, music producer. And, um, and then over here, I'm like, I'll go months where I'm struggling to pay my bills. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And so, but when you when you go through it, you get older, you start to see, oh well, what what does what is success for me? What is it? You know, obviously, money's good. It it alleviates worry. It gives you stability and and all that stuff. But really, what what kind of mark am I wanting to leave on this world? Right? I I I did. I I, I am successful as far as that goes. Well, no matter you know, how much uh, money's in my bank account when I die. The, the the impact I've had is the most important thing to me. Um, and the only reason I even know about that impact is because people are kind enough to express it, to share how, how important these records I've made have been in their lives. And that's really, th that is the reward for me. At I the was end sliding through Reddit the other night, mm -hmm. just looking you up. And mm -hmm. it's amazing the number of people are just like, ding, 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 ding. And then some of them making comments that are maybe giving you a little bit of shit. Mm -hmm. um, but it's a lot of people. A lot of people are just shooting along, you know, and it's just fascinating. It's there's shit going on out there, you know, that you know, you, you don't you don't realize it, you know, but but it is happening. Um, but I, I do agree with you that once you're unburdened with that requirement, and, and one of the things that I, I I've always just fascinated me with people is why weren't they like me? It's one of the, in, the yeah. whole inception here. Yep. Uh, why, you know, okay, so I, I did have some financial success, but mm -hmm. in, in the end, who, who won? You know, right. I, you know, I, I still get up in the morning and shit that bums me out, bums me out. Right. And, you know, and, uh, you know, it's not like I always tell people, it's not like I wake up and go to my uh, brokerage account and turn it on first thing in the morning <laughs> and go, Oh, I'm happy today. Yeah. <laughs> that number's big. Yeah. You know, it's like bullshit. You know? Good number, it happy day. Yeah. You know, what? what is it? You know, yeah. it's not any different but probably between you and I, yeah. other than those areas where maybe uh, money can uh, glide, you know, p slide past a few uh, very aggravating things. Right. But what I would argue that another aggravating thing pops up, you know. Life's For not sure. Get rid of that, I mean, know? yes. And I've had feast and famine in my life. And- but the constant is, am I, am I doing something that I feel is contributing and useful? Like, you know, there, it, it, music is such a weird thing, really, if you step back and look at it, because it is this wholly creative, expressive thing, but you're also trying to make, somehow pay your bills doing it, right? Um, but ultimately, the way that, and the funny part is, is the way that I am able to pay bills making music is if that music is useful to someone, whether it be useful to the person consuming it, listening to it, whether it's affecting them in a way that is positive, or like a, someone making a TV show, like this is the exact song I need for this scene right here, or a commercial TV commercial. I had some music from the job I'm doing right now on some Frito-Lay ads this last summer that I saw on <laughs> TV, In my wife and I w w went to Newport Beach, California for our honeymoon, and we were in there, and just one of the, we were just watching a t show on the in the hotel, and some of my music was on these Frito-Lay ads, and I felt like the biggest rush from that ever, you know, because these run people around, run around the bar, wherever the hell you are. Look, yeah, that's me, that's me. I know it, <laughs> and, and it's silly in some ways because it's not like, oh, I'm on MTV or I'm on this thing like that. 
But I was like, somebody thought something I made was the right thing to use on this ad campaign. And it was just, it's real, it's very gratifying. I'm um, sure it is. I'm yeah. sure it is. You know, it, it must be. And now, obviously, you're in Nashville. So yeah. apparently, he had his ear to the ground that he knew you went off. But speaking of Nashville, why the hell did you go to Nashville? It sounds to me like a, you know, I shouldn't say a big music scene, but. Yeah. So, I mean, whenever I would, before I moved, or, you know, when people ask me, they'd be like, I assume you moved there because of music. And it was, yes. That was a huge part of why I ended up out there. Um, but it really was more of like, I felt like th my time here was sort of done. This sort of era of me working with with Tooth and & Nail and the studio that Brandon and I had um, on Capitol Hill for about 11 years, um, it was just coming to an end. And a lot of that had to do with just my business model wasn't working anymore. You know, I would make these records and I would get in advance and then they would sell and I would they would recoup and I would get royalties and that was all that combined was enough to pay my bills. And basically when people stopped buying records like that, I had to rethink the business model of how sure. I was going to make that work. And one of the ways I thought I would make it work, I was working with this friend that was a manager. Um, he was managing me. And he's like, you know, I looked back and you have 250 songs on these records you produce that you have either co-written or written. And he's like, you're a songwriter. Like, and I was like, well, okay. He's like, so if you're going to go out to Tennessee, try to take a stab at the kind of traditional songwriting scene out there. Because it's one of the bigger songwriting scenes in the world is in Tennessee. Um, if not the biggest, but I'm not sure. And... So I thought, you know, cost of living out there was actually significantly less at the time when I moved out there. Now it's not any different. Um, but when I moved out there, it was. And, um, you know, just thought maybe this will be an adventure, you know, to go. This music community is different, different vibe, completely kind of different way of approaching kind of the way they do things out there versus out here, how I learned. And so I went out there and took a stab at that. And, um, learned a lot of tough lessons <laughs> and kind of ended up back doing what I was doing before I left just out there just making records with bands and and then that this opportunity came along to work with at the company that I work now which is called Sound Stripe um S O U N D S T R I P E one word and they um stripe it okay Sound, sound stripe, stripe, yeah. Sound as in the word, mm -hmm. stripe as in a stripe mm -hmm. in, a, in a shirt. Yeah, so that, like I said, was about six years ago, and that really has allowed me to kind of step back. You know, I'm making, I'm making all this music. I've made, you know, something like three hundred and something songs a year for them for six years. So, um, three hundred a year, you're just <laughs> pumping them out. Yeah. And, but, but sort of have some, you know, a steady paycheck for the first time in my life and kind of take stock again, you know, and Benny's and, and all that stuff. That, 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 that's good stuff. This man. next chapter of what I'm going to be doing. And now I'm at this place where I'm very comfortable doing what I do with them. I love it. And I'm going to start, you know, selectively taking on. Um, kind of traditional re um, record production projects again. And that won't piss them off. No, they they love it. Mm -hmm. Anything I can do to make myself more visible makes what makes my value the value of my songs go up in their yeah. catalog. Yeah. So yeah, and uh, so we're I'm doing a record with a band here next month um, in this studio called the Warhawks. They're from New Jersey. Here in Blash Studios, mm -hmm. Blash, Blash Studios, Studios. That is yeah, great place. Just let me give them a plug. Brian Lash, they're Austin, coming out from great guys. Yeah, they're awesome. They're the Jersey best. boys. They're Jersey Philly boys. They're right on uh -oh, the border. Uh -oh, yeah. Uh oh. Yeah. Uh, where the fuck are these guys yeah. from? <laughs> they're what, right. Town? I don't know, but they're. I mean, they're like. They said they technically live in New Jersey, but they live in Philly. Like mm -hmm. they're just right on the border. Yeah. So you have to be dangerous. Um, A lot of these people from New Jersey, as they float north, north, they become New York people. And it's slowly they because like all New York, they slowly invade. <laughs> <laughs> and once they get if they're once they get a tentacle into you, it's like, ah, we're gonna become giant fans. Run, run, run. 
<laughs> we hate them, you know. But uh, anyway, no, it, it, that's cool if they're coming out here from Jersey. Uh, I'm glad to hear it. Yeah, so that must be you. Must be a pretty popular guy to drag them all the way out here. I I guess. I mean, it's it's Not really. I guess the answer is yes. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I guess. Uh, the. <laughs> When, in my heyday, thank you, thank you, I appreciate it. <laughs> in my kind of heyday in the mid to late two thousands, like I really actually early two thousands to late two thousands, virtually none of the artists I worked with were from here. They were really? all yeah from f- bunch from Florida, Texas, Nashville, Canada. Me no, like all over the place. Um, coming out California, coming up here to make records with their own. Just because they knew you were good at what you did and they heard your name and this, that, and the other thing? Yeah, so it's really... the Matching a record producer up with an artist for a record is 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 very... It's a very intimate thing. It's not like this guy, you know, is qualified and so we're going to... And he's a good price or whatever. It's really like, can this person make the record that this that's in my head that I that I need to make? And so, and it's either sort of evaluated based on, you know, if they're big, if these bands are big fans of other records I've made, and that kind of piles up, and they're like, okay, we want to work with him, you know. So most of these people came in wanting to work with me. They already, like, knew and were familiar with other projects I'd done. Okay. Um, it's not like looking in the yellow pages for a plumber, you know. It's yeah. like, this is a this is a intimate sort of marriage that you're sort of doing it's a relationship you know the and these people end up being some of my closest friends in my whole life you know people Typically that i consider from the time family they show up i know it's probably like varies forever mm-hmm. but from the time they show up to work with you until they get back on the plane and go home and you're done is it six months is it three months could it be a year it varies wildly um it's you know i've done records in a week and i've done records in Six months and everything in between. Um, and it really depends. A number of factors, you know, how ready are they? Yeah. Um, how well can they play? <laughs> um, how much money is, how much money is in their budget? You know, because sure, sure. every day costs a certain amount of money. Sure. So, you know, all those things. But also, you know, some of my favorite records I've ever made, um, one in particular, this um record from an artist called the almost it's it's a band but at the time it was just one person um uh, it's the his first record uh southern weather we made that whole album in like i want to say like 10 days or something like that so they had their shit together yeah and he played the drums and the guitar and the bass and did all the vocals and everything but and it but it was just the energy of the project you know it was like Oh, okay. Boom, 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 boom. Done, done, done. Move on to the next thing. Boom, boom, boom. There wasn't a lot of thought happening. It was just sort of, he's just got a ton of energy and like just this kind of wild So the whole thing. concept of creating, he had come in with his creation, for lack of a better term, like his his internal, like I'm ready to rock on this. Right. I, I know and what. he's very spontaneous and it really, my job was just to kind of rein it in, you know, because he's just got so much energy. <laughs> Um, and just, you know, find that vision and bring it all in. And, and then other records are more like, okay, we really need to feel this and think about this and spend three months, you know, kind of, but you know, they got to have the budget to be able to do that too. Yeah. So. That's a- <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We're not sitting around here just I was just say to people when uh when I would uh, meet them in business, look, we didn't get here because we're good friends. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and my suspicion is if there's no money, we will not be together. <laughs> so right. let's just get that exactly. out of the way. Start yeah. up that way. Mm-hmm. Um and then there was another guy I read, and maybe this is another one who you didn't do a ton of work with, uh Jeremy Camp. Mm-hmm. Did you do work with him mm-hmm. or just a little tiny bit? No, I did um I produced about half uh, he were of his first uh, two records uh, that he did uh, for um, BEC, which is a label that was an offshoot of Tooth and Nail. Because he's he's a pretty popular guy. I, I didn't I didn't realize his level of. Uh, I mean, I guess on Spotify, and now that you've mentioned it, I don't know if he made a damn penny out of it, but. Uh, 31 million, 32 million. Yeah, no, Jeremy, yeah, Jeremy was, so Jeremy is, 
more kind of more of, of a traditional CCM, you know, mu- uh, artist in the Christian music industry. He's a little on the edge, a little more edgy. Um, and he worked with um, multiple producers on both of those records. I think the first one I did about half of, and the second one I did a little less than half of. Um, so he would come up here and we would do those songs. Um, and both of those records are, went gold, yeah. Though, like really? I have actual like gold plaques from those records. They now, traditionally went gold. Without getting it, are you able to make some money out of that? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, good. Good. yeah. Good, not just the gold record to hang up. Yeah, no. There. I mean, yeah, I had uh, royalties on that good stuff. So, yeah. Good for you. Put a lot of work in and something hit it. Yeah. Yeah, because I know he also had a tragedy. He lost his wife uh, at like, she's like 21 to ovarian cancer. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I mean, that is nasty stuff. Crazy. Mm-hmm. I mean, obviously, I've never experienced that, you know. Uh, I lost my mother when I was 25 and my best friend when I was 21, um, which contributed to me uh, making a little stop off at detox and rehab. Um, I handled that very well. Good that phase of my life. I, <laughs> I went with the numb approach. Yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah. Which, yeah. which we can do. But now, now circling back, uh, I'm always curious to hear, like, what are some of the shit shows you've been involved in? And maybe you don't want to mention the name. Uh, like anybody, anything you just got into, and you're just like, oh my god, this is a mess. This is yeah, sure. That happens. And is there any way you could have forecasted that prior to going in? Not always. Um... You know, typical ones are just like, you know, you get the band in. You've heard their demos or you've heard their previous records. You get them in the studio. And so, some of them just aren't good at their instruments. They can't really play. Uh, and You, you know, ever let them know that? Or do you just kind of oh, kindly, yeah. kindly whisk them out? Well, it depends if it's salvageable. Some some of it you can work around with um, editing. and <laughs> You playing everything. Well, yeah. I mean, you guys sit off. That, yeah, and that happened. Um, and it's 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 harder with drummers. Um, there have been times where like I, the drummer of the band wasn't gonna play on his own record. You know, I would just bring someone else in. And you know, the 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 most well, that must bum the guy out. Oh, I mean, the the worst part of the job, honestly, has been these moments where I'm like, you know, you're not. You know, you've worked these all these years being in this band, and you know, in one case, his brother was also in the band, and like, Whoa. you know, uh, you know, years. You know, they've been a band for eight years or something, and I'm like, you're not playing on your record, hmm. and that's a tough. Well, I guess you got if he wants you to perform, do a good job. You got you got to do it. You know, I can't I, do my job if he's yeah. playing on the record. Yeah, you, you know s- what I'm saying? Mean, I just literally can't do it. So it's know, either we had that with young sales guys who are great guys mm-hmm. and gals. They come in. And I would really like them. And then they would come in and I'd just look, I don't want to bum you out. You know, and probably if I bump into you five years from now in the mall, you're, you're probably going to be someone, I hope we can say hi and yeah. you'll be a whole nother person. Yep. Unfortunately, this job and your personality just don't match up. Right. Yep. And, you know, I, maybe you resign rather than I, I don't want to yeah. terminate <laughs> yeah. you. Yeah. You know, you can resign and we can do this very eloquently. Yes, yeah. Uh, or you can, you know, if you want to fight me tooth and nail, but it is going to conclude here. Yeah. Our time together. It's a similar thing. And, and you know, there were there have been times where I'm like, either someone else is going to play on this record or I'm not doing this record. And it's mm-hmm. not because I'm trying to be a dick or trying to no. have some power over. It's like I just... F- like logistically can't do my job if if this is what I'm working with. Um, no, if it gets it's, it's same as me. You yeah. know, I I gotta sell stuff. Right. If you can't help me sell, right. Then and that you were hired to sell. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, then we I can't get we from have a point problem. A to B without, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, a big problem. Yeah. You know. So that's hard. Um, records that. You know, a, another really difficult thing is, is when the artists can never commit to finishing anything. It's always, ah, let's do this. Let's try this. Let's do this. No, that's not done. Or, or they, I like it. Or this is perfect. And then a week later, no, we need to change this and this. And it, and it's just perpetually never finished. That is maybe the most frustrating oh, thing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, 
very rarely have I had any nightmare stories where the label or management or someone, some sort of suit, quote unquote, steps in and tries to get heavy handed and um, change, kind of change what it is we're doing. That's only happened to me a couple times. I don't really have, I, you know, you hear in the business, you hear about all these horror stories of that happening, but I was fortunate enough to really not have that happen. Yeah, when it comes to man. Yeah, but, you know, just when you're working with artists, um, especially mostly younger artists, and you're trying to get their best performances out of them, especially singers and, you know, especially singers, but everyone really involved. You're trying to get their performance. It's it's so psychological. You know, you're really trying to get them in this environment where they feel safe to express themselves. They feel confident, but, you you know, you don't want them too cocky either because you got to be able to play nice. You have to be a team. You know, everybody's on the same team. We're all trying to make the great record. I'm not trying to hog any of your spotlight here. I'm just trying to give you something that you can – unapologetically give to the world and say, this is us. This is me. This is yeah, who the, I am. The parallels are so interesting because I, I, I sold my business and now I train these young guys mm -hmm. about our industry and mm -hmm. I try to teach them how to sell. And whiz bang's no longer a game. It's just never been mm -hmm. for the last 25, 30 years, ever since I did it. Yeah. It's all about consultive, you know, can I help you if you don't need it? Right. Just walk away. But Trying to teach these guys, like I can say, here's what you should say, but no, that what you have to do is you have to be able to just kind of make it like a music. You have to just be able to talk and you'll know where to go. Right. I, I can't tell you to ask question A and B right. and C. It all rides it's on intuitive. where does that mm -hmm. person want to go Right. and maybe they don't want to go anywhere. Right. Well, then pack up your bags yep. and get the fuck out. Right. Yeah. It, I think... Yeah, there, there's a lot of parallels there, and it, it's it's something that's I get it's you selling. difficult to I teach. Get you, selling. <laughs> you know, I'm in the bag business, and it's a very high end <laughs> business. You know, very high end. I'll try anything. <laughs> <laughs> Sing a jingle. <laughs> yeah. Well, so my wife Shelly um, is her background is sales, and let, she's let me let me introduce you. Got married in June. Yes. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. I forgot to bring that up. Yeah. Wow. So. Yeah. Uh, June. Holy shit, that's like six months ago. Yeah. Yep. Wow. Yeah. Good for you. Congratulations. Thank you. Yeah. You know? Never never knew this level of um happiness and fulfillment was possible. I was pretty cynical about it to be honest. So well, a lot of people are. Yeah. A lot of people are. It's I've been married for thirty three years and I'll say this, uh I would marry the girl again today. <laughs> That's the truth, and I wish that uh, to you too. Awesome. If you if you got thirty three years left in the tank, I don't. Yeah. I don't know. I'm not going to speak to that. Yeah. Let's you know? not bring that up. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, that's a, that's a different podcast. That's just a, that's the end of life <laughs> yeah. with Mark podcast. <laughs> Let's take morbid conversations around slightly older people's lives. <laughs> <laughs> when I can see the dark door. <laughs> oh, that's horrible. That's awesome. <laughs> but uh, anyway, so tell me about your wife now, now that we've got on the subject. So she is, her background is sales. She was, you know, managed, she was mostly in the furniture business um, and started in sales and then became a sales manager and then kind of moved into this team place where she was kind of brought into these stores as kind of a bigger chain in the South called American Signature um, that she was working for. And where, you know, if the store was having trouble, they'd bring her in to basically fix the sales team up. Oh, cool. cool. And she was opening locations and um, training the entire team, all the salespeople and managers and everything. Because every store she went into, if they talked her into managing one of these stores, they would just, their sales would go like that. She knew her shit. So, yeah. I mean, it's in her blood. She loves it. It's just her favorite thing to do. So, um, and she's been really, she's seeing sort of the parallels from um, marketing music and and kind of the business side approach, which isn't really my forte. Yeah, I'm more yeah, of the yeah. make, like I can make the records, I can make the songs, but the business side, side but being able to sort of combine her, because she's, and, but she's a, huge music person too she Good. absolutely loves music when we first met it turned out 
she kind of had to confide in me a few days after we first met that she didn't know who I was. She, what? But <laughs> when she Googled me, she, she realized that one of her favorite records of all time I had produced. Cool. So she was like kind of tripping out what about that. What was the name that. of that album? It's a band called Every Avenue um, from, uh, where are they from originally? I feel like they're from Michigan. Every Avenue. Yeah, a plug. Bad Habits is the name of the album. But Every um, Avenue. Bad habits. It's a it's a good, it's a great record. Good, uh, good. But yeah, and it was just funny. Like these records that she had listened to. There's uh, there's other ones too that she had heard, and kind of these circles we'd been around. And we realized that there was this. There's another band I've worked with a lot called Anne Berlin, and they are one of the bigger bands that I've worked with. Yeah, and, I saw I saw their name. Yeah, and in like 2012, like right after I had moved to Tennessee, I was doing i was doing one of their records and they played a show in nashville and we realized you know we realized you know 10 years later almost that we were both at that same oh, show cool, and stuff cool. like that so, so yeah. is she a southern girl yeah she's wow, from you know yeah you know. from tennessee yeah they can have a very um charming um i don't know sort of i don't know um uh, kind of a I don't know what to say. It's just a very charming way to approach yeah. people and talk. And it's kind of, I don't know yeah. if she's that way, but it's kind of a. She's, yeah, she's amazing. She's yeah. got a ton, a huge heart and a, a lot of fire too, you good, know? Yeah. Good. good. Yeah. Yeah. Because if you're a sales manager, she knows the drill. Mm -hmm. You know, it is all about, I'm sure just like your industry, hard work and, you know, and, and not, you know, it's no good faking. People sniff out fakers very quickly. You can't not, fake it because yeah. you're you're trying to meet someone's needs, right? If there's an actual true need there, how can I get it there? Get it there yeah. for you. Yeah. You know that's it's there's if you break it down to that fundamental, there's no difference between no, the two. No, things. no, well, because that's what you're doing. You're marketing a product. No yeah. different than what I'm doing. Yeah. Um, who knows? Maybe if we got together 20 years ago, I could have made a shekel on you. <laughs> You never know. You never know. I wouldn't have given any of you. I'm that kind of guy. I just robbed your ass blind. <laughs> You're like the really nice guy. Yeah, a dime for me, half a penny for you. That's fair. <laughs> so you you sound like you are in the music industry. <laughs> I'm the shirt. <laughs> you know, my business was bought by, originally one of the investors was a, a small arm of uh, a company called Berkshire Hathaway, which is this huge investment company. Mm -hmm. And they would come in and do these audits on us. And we, you know, we we're a pretty conservative business, but very Seattle and kind of loosey goosey. Yeah. And I would always send these emails shirts in tomorrow. <laughs> Get ready. <laughs> Get your shit together. <laughs> Shirt alert. <laughs> exactly. Oh, you'll know when they show up. <laughs> and they would. They'd show up, you know, pretty like, when they came in, a room got chilly. Yeah. Chilly. <laughs> no more laughing, Marky. No more jokes. Just show them numbers. You know. I love uh, it. That was pretty good. So so you know, um, I just thought a lot of times I like to wrap up with a question that you've sort of answered, but mm -hmm. two things. Um, any advice to some of the people out there that are maybe, maybe pursuing your career mm -hmm. or another one that's, um, maybe, you know, in that age group that I'm talking about, any kind of pros, cons, goods, bads? Yeah, I think I get this question a lot and sometimes I feel like I'm the worst qualified person to answer it because I do feel like I just kind of kept my nose down and just kept doing what I couldn't not do, what mm -hmm. I was so passionate about. And the people showed up. The sure. opportunities showed up. Um, but I think now, nowadays, you know, like I was saying earlier, the technology is so available. And, um, you know, a lot of people are like, what school should I go to to become a music producer, a recording engineer, or a songwriter? And I'm always like, you should save your money at first, at least, <laughs> and <laughs> buy, <laughs> buy yourself some software mm -hmm. and see if you even like it. See if that's sure. even what you really want to sure. do. Because the chances are, if if you are on the same path I was on, you don't need to ask anybody how to do it because you're already doing it. Yeah. Um, now, as far as getting exposure and stuff like that, I think that – and getting the experience, I think the number one word is collaboration, finding other people 
that are on your same trajectory, on your same path, and collaborating with them, finding other artists, musicians, producers, whoever, getting in and learning from other people. Are there any, like, um, places where they congregate? Like, you know, there'll be professional places or just somewhere where it's like, hey, group of artists are getting together over here. Some way of networking? I think, you know, because the music industry or music in general is so diverse as far as the, t- the genres and subgenres and scenes and all that. It's really about, I think nowadays finding your people online in communities online and finding, uh, you know, if you're lucky enough to find someone that you met in real life, that's doing mm-hmm. something similar that you can get in the same room with them. I think there's a lot of value. But there's not in like face I mean, to face. In some in some trade shows, from you know, they'll be like, oh, not that small I know of. Expo. Not that I know of. That's not it really been a part of of my uh, story. But you know, definitely, you know, you see oh, thousands, probably th- thousands of people a year move into L.A. or Nashville to be songwriters or whatever, or try to make it. You know, there's obviously more of a community, more um, concentrated communities. Same here in Seattle. There's a pretty, pretty established kind of music scene. Oh, there. absolutely. It's just a very different flavor than you know Nashville versus LA. So they are getting a bit homogenized. They're starting to get, you know, Nashville. You know, a lot of people when I told them I was moving there, they're like, "You don't do country music," and I was like, "Well, that's not the only thing they do in Nashville. Like, yeah. every everybody's doing a little bit of everything now." But yeah, really, um, collaboration. Learning from, you know, getting getting to getting to be in the room with people that I was already looking up to as engineers and producers um, was the most valuable thing to me in the world. Oh, Just cool. getting to glean off of of them and uh, what they were doing. Um, but the other thing is, is I I have really maintained this attitude that no one or I should not do a double negative everyone has something to teach me regardless of if they are 15 years old and they just started making music I can learn something from them yeah. um and yeah, I, I used to coach little kids in sports I played men's lacrosse when I was a young guy and I came out here and coached I wanted to play I wanted to coach the teams that weren't any good yeah, I didn't want to. I don't want to coach anybody. It's like rah, rah, we're gonna go kick ass and <laughs> yeah. knock. I did all that. You know, I played through college. Now I'm just want to meet young kids. Yeah, who are, just want to have some fun. Yeah, and there, I learned so much from them. Some yeah. of them, you know, just like like some of them, I real I like. I want to be him. I mean, he's only twelve, but I like. Yeah, I, I think I I want to be him. Right. You know. <laughs> no, and that is. I mean, if I if I never stop. If I ever stop learning and growing, and then it's I'm I'm done. I'm over. Toast. Like I don't. I, I'm never like oh I made it here. There is no here. You know what I mean. The here is the the whole journey. You know right. to be cliche, but it really is. And uh, without stealing your words, well, I'm going to ask you one more time because we always do that when when we close. Mm-hmm. So you said at the beginning. Well, I won't you say that. Let's just start off. We always ask at the get at the end is you know why did you do this. Why? Mm -hmm. At the core. I couldn't not do it. That's cool. Yeah. I mean, that's... that's, I had to do it. It wasn't even a choice. (laughs) Exactly. I say, you think I wanted to sell goddamn bags for a living? (laughs) Mark my words, no. (laughs) Well, anyway, I want to thank thank you very much, uh, Aaron Sprinkle, for coming on today and uh he can be reached at aaron sprinkle music.com mm-hmm. and uh why don't you just run down your your uh your your coordinates one more time before we say goodbye yeah thank you so much for having me it's really been a pleasure um yeah yeah you can hit me up um aaron sprinkle on instagram or facebook or um aaron sprinkle music.com is my website but instagram's a really good place to hit me up too so Good. Um, well, we'll just close out by saying, uh, I hope you'll cheer for the Phillies this afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> you got it. <laughs> Mariners are nowhere around yeah, this no. damn thing. Yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So what listen, thank you and have a nice day. Yeah, likewise. Thanks for tuning in to the Mark Halley Show. Hope you'll join us again. Adios. <laughs>